you are a narcissistic abuse specialist and mm-hmm. recovery coach. Mm-hmm. So with that hat on, <laughs> I have some questions for you that I thought we could go through. Um, and question number one is probably the, you know, just the most obvious question. What is narcissism? Hello and welcome to the Go Encourage podcast, where I talk to real people about real life, trying to gain some insight from their experiences around building courage. This episode is part of our relationship series and I am joined by Tiara Thomas, who is a narcissistic abuse specialist and recovery coach. This topic is a little bit of a heavy one today, I'll just say in advance, but I think we're going to get some real good insight from someone who's an expert in this field. So let's get started. Hello, Tiara. Welcome to the Go Encourage podcast. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Thanks so much for asking me to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you uh, agreed to come along and talk to us about courage. And uh, we're in a relationship series at the moment. um, And I know you'll bring a lot to the conversation. So thank you again. Um, I want to kick off by asking you what your name means. What does Tiara mean? Well, if you look up the dictionary definition, it's a woman's decorative headband, but (laughs) traditionally it's the things that little girls wear on their heads if they want to dress like a princess. (laughs) Amazing. Amazing. I thought as much, but um, yeah, just get some clarity from you there. Mm -hmm. Lovely. All right. Um, Can you tell us where you're from? Uh, Where did you grow up? Family dynamics, things like that? Absolutely. Um, I was born and raised in the heart of the Napa Valley um, in California. Um, I grew up in a very small religious town, which is kind of ironic in the middle of wine country. Um, my family is Seventh-day Adventist, and so we kind of lived in this like little, for lack of a better word, cult-like community <laughs> um, up in the hills there. And um, I was actually raised by a single mother um, and my grandparents. We kind of lived in like a family compound. My grandparents live right next door and my mom and I um, next to them. And I grew up very sheltered and, like I said, in a religious community, so didn't really step outside of that community even until after college. Um, there's a little, that in that town, there's a little private college that exists mm-hmm. there. That's a Seventh-day Adventist college. So I actually went through elementary, high school, and college um, in Seventh-day Adventist schools and then, and then branched out into the world after that. So that's kind of my, my early upbringing and background. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, could you speak to what that sort of religious community sort of like paraphrased, what what would that look like in terms of belief system? Um, Seventh-day Adventism is um, kind of like, I, I, I describe it as like a blend between like baptism and maybe Judaism, um, mm-hmm. simply because they observe the Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath Saturday. And it's kind of like a sundown Friday night to sundown um, Saturday night, very strict, you know, no television, no um, doing normal things. They're very strict on the Sabbath. Um, There's a lot of uh, health doctrine with Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventists are known for their hospitals. So there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventist hospitals all over the U.S. um, and worldwide, really. Um, And like I said, it was very sheltered. Like our, it's a very tight knit community. So, um, you know, if anyone who's something I would totally relate to this but you don't really like fraternize with a lot of people outside of your community you kind of like stick to um each other which is interesting because I live in Utah now and it's Utah is known for Mormon country and I can relate a lot to the Mormons because it's very similar in terms of like how um you know like like a lot of religions where it's like you know our way is the right way and um, we know we've got it all figured out kind of thing. I never really connected well with the religion itself. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom was kind of a buffer between my grandparents who were very strict um, in the religious community. And then my mom was kind of, but not really. So she was a buffer for me that I, I didn't really feel like I, I, I kind of just went along with it until I got to the age where I was like, this is, doesn't really resonate with me. <laughs> and um, which is funny because my husband actually was raised in the same church. Um, he oh. had a very different experience. Um, he he was like very devoutly religious until he was about 25. And then he had a, a, a breaking with the church. For me, it was more of like a gradual distancing from it. 
because mm-hmm. I just I just saw so much hypocrisy. And I know a lot of people leave religion mm-hmm. for those purposes. I saw a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of judgment and things like that. And maybe that was mainly mainly coming from my grandmother, who I believe now. And it's funny because my uncle was the one who pointed it out. Um, he takes care of her now. Is I believe she's a covert narcissist, and she's very. Um, uses religion to kind of beat you over the head with a stick. Mm. Um, and so that kind of really turned me off to that religion, I think, at a very young age. Um, but great people, great community. Uh, I, I feel privileged to have actually grown up in a, in a community like that because it was very safe. Um, mm. I could ride my bike at like 10 years old around the town and not have to worry about a thing and kind of have a lot of mm. independence and that sort of thing. So there were some benefits to it as well. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. All right. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yes. Yeah, I come from sort of, I come from London, so it's very diverse and there's all sorts of different flavors and things like that. So it's really interesting to think of a, a community that's so tight knit and all share the same, you know, religious framework or, or belief system. Um, okay. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah, um, definitely had an influence on my worldview in a good way, I think. Um, okay. Because I got to see kind of what I didn't want to, mm. you know, like the, the the exclusiveness, the exclusion, like all of those things I was like, that doesn't feel good. Mm. Um, <laughs> so um, I had kind of more of a reactionary response to a lot of that, which I think actually influenced me in a positive way. Okay. Oh, I like that influence you in a positive way. Does that, if you don't mind me asking, is that, oh, and we've got, we've got pretty into it straight away, but um, in terms of your, your faith system, your belief system, um, you know, there is a there, there when it, when we're talking about religion, there is a there's a whole. I mean, we could go on. We could do like eight podcasts on this, right? But um, there is, you know, there is a framework, or there's a community, uh, or a culture. But then, out like, not trying to take away from that, but there's also just a one to one connection between you and God, or your Creator, or however you label that um, that being. Say, um, is that something that that you know you continued with um, moving forward? I, I kind of got away from it for a while. I was very disconnected, I think, from any sort of spirituality or religion. Um, and I think as I got older, I started to becoming become more interested in philosophy and, you know, that sort of thing. And really just taking bits and pieces from all religions and understanding, like, the core principles that kind of are at, you know, the, the base of every religion, which I think is love. Um, you know, love and compassion and that sort of thing. And so that is, that's really what I try to um, bring into my daily practices, meditations and that sort of thing is just this concept of, you know, and this wonder of like, maybe even not trying to put a label on it or just Mm -hmm. not having to think that I know, I I know where existence is coming from, or I know this Mm -hmm. thing that we call God. And just constantly keeping that as like a as an exploration, you know, um, Mm -hmm. studying, I I like love studying philosophy. I love studying ancient cultures and religions and, and all of those things and just kind of taking what resonates with me. Um, and then just kind of adding that into my own personal philosophy. I don't, I don't really identify with one particular religion or, you know, faith, but I do feel like I have a deep connection to what we might call like source or, um, God or, you know, the origin of of life which is love i i i i love that i love the simplicity of that as well that at the core is love right that's you know when you when you slice this up that's on the inside that's kind of what we're all looking for and 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 trying to you know trying to give as well um when we're at our best um yeah thank you for that i again i could talk to you for hours about that but uh i, I brought you in for a specific uh theme so let's get back to that uh, yeah. but again before we do i you know really want to get to know you a little bit more so um when you were growing up uh can you remember back to being that 10 year old on your bike let's say um uh, when you were growing up you know was there something that you aspired to be was there a career path that you had in mind um something like that I think I bounced around a lot as a child. The only thing I really remember is I loved animals a lot. And so I think I wanted at one point to be a marine biologist, but then I think that kind of went by the wayside because I'm not really a science person. <laughs> and I realized how many science classes I would have to take. Um, I also really enjoyed art. Um, I did a lot of art 
at a very young age. Um, so that's another, that was another passion of mine that I thought I could see myself, you know, becoming as an artist or something like that. Mm. Okay. So creative by nature. Mm. Okay. And then fast forwarding to where you're at now, what, what is it that you actually do? So uh, my life's taken quite a few twists and turns. I actually did end up with a fine art degree um, and an associates in photography as well, um, which I did not end up pursuing after college. Um, and then I was a, a career waitress for 10 years, uh, working in the Napa Valley and in Los Angeles. Um, but now I am a narcissistic abuse recovery coach and a narcissistic abuse specialist. Um, so quite a difference from where I started. Yeah, that's a... A journey indeed yeah absolutely I love that you mentioned photography I'm a, I'm a photographer myself and I just think uh, uh, what a beautiful way to see the world behind a lens and sort of you know it really helps shape your perspective in the way that you look at things um, mm -hmm. and then in terms of what you do now we're going to get to that so um, before we do I've got some uh, I've got some quick fire questions for you how do you feel about some quick fire questions sounds good all right so what's your go-to comfort food uh, anything sweet uh, ice cream, sweet. cookies, like you name it. <laughs> chocolate, especially, definitely chocolate. I love the honesty. That's brilliant. Yeah, because <laughs> everyone's so scared of sugar now, right? No one talks about it, so that's brilliant. <laughs> I try to, I try to keep it in check, but I definitely have a sweet tooth. That's for sure. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, and um, what's your favorite cuisine? Uh Japanese food. Oh, Japanese. Uh, I, I could eat Japanese food every day. What kind of dish comes to mind when you think Japanese? Um, I love sushi. Um, I love gyoza. Gyoza is good. And um, there's this little Japanese restaurant that we have in our town. I don't know if it's at every Japanese restaurant, but they have these like quail egg shooters. All right. Um, that they're like oyster shooters. They're really good. Cool. All right. Um, what's your favorite place if you've traveled around a little bit? Um, Manuel Antonio in Costa Rica. Um, oh. I've been there three times and it's, I just always end up back there so for some, for all random odd reasons. Um, and it's, it's definitely my absolute favorite place to be. The beach what, what's, is beautiful. What's there? What's, oh, beaches, did you say? Yeah. So there, it's, it's right near, um, like a state park. So there's, there's a, there's a state, like a preserve there. A lot of the beaches in Costa Rica are not that pretty. Like a lot of them are kind of flat and brown. Um, but this particular one is like that you know, picturesque white sand beaches. Um, it's warmer there. There's beautiful sunsets. Um, I ended up there after a retreat that I took like probably like almost 10 years ago now. Um, and then I went to, and to, did another retreat. And somehow at the end of that retreat, even though it wasn't even close to there, we ended up there at the end anyways. Um, and then I took a yoga teacher training a couple of years later and just happened to be in the same exact town. So some oh, wow. something keeps pulling me back there. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay. All right. Um, what's your favorite season? Um, summer for sure. Um, right. I like the heat and um, the summer activities and, you know, water. I love being in the water when it's hot. So that's yeah, my favorite. Nice. Um, star sign? If you, oh, if Libra. You Libra. All right. I did, did you think you are a bit of a balancer? Or? I think I... I'm always striving for balance, <laughs> not necessarily always achieving it. Um, another per perfectionist is another um, characteristic of Libra, and that's definitely right. been myself. Not so much more recently, but when I was younger, for sure. Right, getting all things perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Cats or dogs? Do you have a preference? Cats. They're low maintenance. They, they are low maintenance. Yeah, this is true. I used to have a cat. And it was like, honestly, so easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was the last movie that you watched? Um, I think it was, what was it called? Uh, they Cloned Tyrone. Uh, oh. Very bizarre movie. My husband and I just found on Netflix. I think it was Netflix. Very interesting. It was like about like government control and mind control in like African-American communities. It was very very interesting movie cool. jamie fox was in it <laughs> cool all right i haven't heard of that one is that is yeah. that like a comedy or is it actually like a serious it was know? kind of both it was like a dark oh. comedy i think oh, okay yeah okay 
All right. Um, would you say you are a introvert or an extrovert? We're coming back to that Libra balance now. Yeah, I'm an introverted extrovert. Um, <laughs> I've not heard that one before. <laughs> yeah, because I really like being alone. Like I, like I don't. I like kind of, but every once in a while, I've got to get out. And mm. I am pretty reserved if I don't know you. But if I get to know you, then my personality comes out, and I'm pretty loud, and you can't shut me up. Mm, okay. All right. So like, you like to sort of warm warm up a little bit around yeah. people and get to know them a little bit. Okay, that's fair. Uh, logical or emotional? What side of the scale do you think you fall on? Definitely logical. Okay. I'm not, I'm not super emotional. I can get there, but I have a tendency to rely more on logic than emotion. Interesting. So I was so... I was I was thinking you'd be more emotional just because of the whole art sort of thing. You know, that's kind mm -hmm. of like the stereotype, isn't it? But yeah, that's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you someone who kind of makes things happen? You take action or are you more go with the flow? I'm definitely a doer. Um, yeah. If I put my mind to something, I can I can manifest it like that. But yeah, I definitely take a lot of action for sure. You use the word manifest there, right? I was having a conversation with my colleague today about this word, and I think it slightly triggers him a little bit because it is a word that gets used a lot. And so I looked it up in the dictionary. No, before I before I tell you what I think, when you say manifest, what do you mean? Um, I think it's like a form of creation, you know. And I think that there's, I think sometimes people think manifestation is something that's passive, um, mm -hmm. and I see it as something that's like you go for it and you create the circumstances and the mindset and everything that has to happen in order to create that thing. It's not something that's like, Oh, I'm just going to like sit here and think about it. And then it's going to come to me. <laughs> so that's kind of how I think of manifestation. Yeah. I think that, uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm in the same sort of ballpark as well. I think it's some, I think manifestation is really just making something clear, isn't it? Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, showing intention to go in a particular direction uh, where the word manifesto comes from as well when we're talking on the political sort of um, landscape as well. Um, okay, all right, we're on the same page. Um, uh, okay, so uh, a little bit deeper, a TV show or a book that's had an impact on you recently? Hmm. Um, well, I'm kind of only a few chapters into this book that my husband and I just started recently, but it's very interesting. It's called Existential Kink. Um, and it's basically a really interesting take on shadow work and um, looking at like the things that you like your addictions and the things that you're ashamed of mm -hmm. and how those things actually make you feel good um, and how Ooh. if you embrace that. Um, you can actually break through, you know, stock patterns and, you know, money blocks or, you know, things like that. Because, and it's, it's interesting because it mirrors my work really well. Um, because a big part of my work is, is learning how to sit with discomfort and learning how to embrace and have compassion towards the parts of ourselves that we've rejected. And mm -hmm. so this is just like a whole nother twist on that. And I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying that perspective. Okay. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I have to have a little look into that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have you ever taken the love languages test? A long time ago. I think, uh, I think I came back physical touch. Okay. All right. And what was the next one after that? Do you remember if it was a while ago? Uh, I, oh. I'm trying to remember. I, I always ask people their top two because I think they yeah, can be Yeah, I don't remember. I just remember that one sticking out so much because I'm like, yep, mm, yeah, that's definitely true. Yeah, um, which is interesting because, and not to go too deep into this, but um, I have a tendency to have more of a disorganized attach attachment style leaning more towards avoidant. Mm -hmm. And I've been, you know, there's some interesting stuff about how avoidant individuals have a tendency to use physical intimacy as like a primary way for like vulnerability and connection and so I'm like that's so interesting that that would be my primary love mm. language and I think that this also manifests too because those are our deficiencies from childhood the things sure. that we didn't get uh, are often the things that we you know that becomes our love language because we we have such a deficiency there We're like we need extra of that mm. in order to feel mm. loved that's really interesting w would it be okay if I asked what your husband's um love languages oh no not love language uh attachment because if you if you're saying you're leaning slightly to the avoidant um, my husband is 
definitely more on the anxious attachment mm -hmm. style, which is interesting because he has some characteristics of avoidant as well. And mm -hmm. what I think of attachment styles is I don't think that they're as fixed as we would like to think they are. Yeah, I agree. And I think that w when we get into certain relationships, like we'll have a dynamic that will pull certain things out of us. So I've been more anxious in past relationships and I've been more avoidant in this relationship, which I think has brought out his anxiousness <laughs> in mm -hmm. this relationship. And his love language is words of affirmation, funny enough. So we kind of have like, you know, I'm the avoidant. And it's like, so giving those words of affirmation is a little bit challenging and tricky for me sure. to like remember to do that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so interesting, like how we get in relationships that like challenge us to improve in areas that we might be like avoidant of or, you know, blind to as well. Um, I think they're such a, it, it, they're so useful as indicators, as maps to kind of figure out, you know, what's going on, you know, what kind of patterns that we're seeing in each other and things like that. So um, I think, you know, gone are the days where, and I'm going back, I might be showing my age a little bit where, you know, you get into a relationship and you just spend time together and that's it, you know? Yeah. Whereas now we're like, oh, actually, oh, the reason I feel like this is because I'm looking for this and, you know, my partner's looking for that and things like that. So, um, okay. All right. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, what is a good compliment that you remember someone said about you? Well, you know, I'm having a hard time figuring, thinking about a specific compliment, but there's one thing that I do get occasionally that always makes my day, which is if I have like a previous client or someone who has been following me and they just tell me that I've changed their life in some way, you know, that I've had some sort of influence. And this happens sometimes with people that I've never even met before, just based oh, yeah. on, you know, the content that I share on Instagram. And mm -hmm. when I get those messages, it just it makes all of the hard work that I put in over the last couple of years worth it. And, and it just always makes me feel really good that, you know, people are resonating with that and that it's actually helping someone. Um, mm. That's probably the best compliment that I could ever get for sure. Amazing. And what, what a sense of fulfillment as well, because what, you know, the, I'm learning that creating content, <laughs> you know, takes some thought, it takes some effort. It takes a lot of heart as well. You know, let's be honest. Um, and knowing that it is actually making an impact, blessing someone, um, you know, it, it makes it all worth the while, um, more so than, you know, uh, doing it for maybe the wrong reasons. Um, right. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's beautiful. That's lovely to, to get that kind of feedback for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do you, what, what do you think people misunderstand about you? Um, that I've got it all together. <laughs> 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 um, I think sometimes... Uh, I, you know, maybe some people, and I do try to like, be like, I'm not perfect at this, but this is how this goes, you know, cause I do give a lot of advice to people and I, you know, try to help them with like, you know, certain stuck patterns and things like that in their life. But that doesn't mean that I don't have my own stuff still to deal with. Um, and, but I see that as a good thing. Like, I don't, I don't try not to be like, Oh, I should be here. Or I should be there. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, I see that as just a learning opportunity, but yeah, I think so, and I think social media, I think is one of those things too, where you just get a snippet of someone's life. You don't really get the whole picture. Yeah. Um, and I, people would probably be surprised at the, the, the normal struggles and things that I deal with in my day to day with my kids and with my husband and, you know, business and all of those things. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I think it's really good. And, you know, touching on what we talked about right at the beginning in terms of, you know, being in, in a religious community where people are trying to be holier than thou and be the experts at particular things and then to try and project that onto someone else who's going through a journey. Um, you know, it's 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 off-putting just, you know, to receive that, to be on the receiving end. Whereas if you're, if you're talking to someone who is quite vulnerable and there's a lot of courage that comes with that and to say, look, I haven't got it figured out, but here's some research that I've done or here's some stuff that I've seen that's out there that I think might be able to help you in your situation. You know, I think that goes a lot further. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a, do you have a last question before we get into uh, some, some, some real meat i hope is um do you have a daily routine about your life uh you know maybe a routine or a rhythm that you kind of try to subscribe to um you know to keep yourself productive keep yourself you know in a place where you're grounded 
Yeah, um, I've I've always struggled with that, but more recently, um, one of the things that has kind of become a non-negotiable, which is uh, meditation. Um, I'm discovering that if I don't, I sleep poorer and I'm I'm not as sharp. Um, and what I've really been enjoying, actually, I don't know if you're familiar, if you're familiar with Joe Dispenza at all, but I really really enjoy his meditations. Um, they I've been having a lot of sleep issues recently because. I'm in my first trimester of pregnancy and, um, Congratulations. It's, thank you. And it's, but it's just like sucking the light. I shouldn't say it's sucking the life out of me. It's, it's just, it's impacting my nervous system in a way that is causing me to have a lot of sleep issues and which is common for me. My first two pregnancies was kind of the same way. So, um, what's saving my life is meditation and, you know, mm. um, doing that before bed. Sometimes I'll even do like, if I have time, like a 40 minute meditation in the morning, I, before I was like, I don't have time for that. And right now I'm like, I don't, I, if I don't do it, I'm kind of useless anyway. Mm. So I might as well make time for that. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of been forced into really making that part of my regular routine. And um, I think it's something that I, I tell people all the time to do. And so it's nice that um, I have this opportunity to really kind of lean into that. And um, I like guided meditations. I have a hard time just sitting and just, you know, so I, I actually create a lot of guided meditations for my clients and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and so it's nice to be able to kind of utilize some for myself and uh, really s reap the benefits of that as well. Amazing. And and if if someone was listening and they were like, oh my gosh, this sounds so alien to me, like, why would I ever do that? You know, could you, could you speak to that? Could you, you know, say what the benefits are or if someone's starting out, where would they go to, you know, to, to, maybe even start that process themselves? Yeah, well, you know, a really good selling point for me is that um, especially if you struggle with sleep and, and like focus and that sort of thing, um, is that doing like a 20 minute med meditation is basically like an hour of sleep. It's like sleep for your brain, um, a rest for your, for your brain. And so, you know, when you, especially you're doing a guided meditation, maybe that has some sort of theta brain waves or binaural beats or something like that, that helps to get you into a theta brain wave state. It really does help to your acuity, your focus, um, you know, and actually help you to feel rested, even if you didn't good, get good rest. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was a pretty big, big selling point for me because, um, you know, just with sleep issues and that sort of thing. And I've had adrenal issues for probably the last like 15 years. Um, and I've improved so much in my gut health, mental health, you know, but the adrenal thing is just like the last thing that's been hanging on. And so, you know, meditation is one of those things that can really help to repair and restore. And so just, there's a lot of physical benefits other than, you know, mental mm -hmm. health. And then, also, um, you know, one of the things that I kind of guide people towards is somatic meditation, which is where you're basically doing an internal exploration and learning how to sit with the, what you're feeling in your body and, and really embrace it. And so there can be other benefits as well in terms of um, developing emotional resiliency and really connecting with yourself. So, you know, there's, there's a wide range of different types of meditations and things like that that you can do. Um, helping you to program the subconscious, for example. So um, YouTube is a great place to go if you're looking for meditations. There's it's just a plethora of things. And even Spotify has, you know, some some mm. guided meditations and things like that. But as I mentioned, Joe Dispenza, you can look him up. There's He does, they're kind of weird, uh, to be honest, because he uses this like weird tone of voice, but right. it works. Um, and I can tell, like, like I, my head's nodding, like within the first few minutes. So, so I can tell it's like, putting me into that brainwave state. Um, and then it's kind of programming your subconscious in a lot of ways. Um, Cause when you get into that faint theta brainwave state, your mind is much more open and receptive. Um, mm. And so there can be, you know, meditations can have a wide range of benefits, but those particular meditations. Um, and if you're not familiar with Joe Dispenza's work, like he, his work is amazing. He basically healed his spine after being in a major car accident and having his spine crushed um, through meditation, no surgery or anything. Um, wow. he's a chiropractor. And so he would just visualize his, his spine healing. And he did that for hours a day for like six or six weeks or something like that. And it was actually able to heal his own spine without surgery. So, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of science backing that sort of thing, the, the, the powerful connection between the mind and the body as well. I know from a Christian perspective, you know, to meditate on, um, 
you could call it an affirmation or a, a scripture or, or a, a, an element of truth or a virtue. And what you're doing is you're really bringing that focus of all the stuff that's going on and all the emotions into one central place where then you can sort of be still and receive and really understand where you're at. Yeah. And I think a lot of times too, just, you know, just a side note with meditation is that I think people think or have this like misguided concept that meditation, the, the intention of it is to not think, mm. is to like make your mind blank. <laughs> I'm laughing because that's, that's where I came. I was like, yeah. oh, what? what I, <laughs> Yeah. and yeah. it I mean that's really an impossible task because mm. our mind is just a generator that's what it does mm. it's constantly reacting and responding to our environment and to our stressors from the day so really mm. the, in- the the core intention of meditation is to be an observer is to mm. learn to to just watch the thoughts and go oh that's interesting like and having curiosity um, the somatic meditation that I teach my clients is very much like that. But instead of observing the thoughts, we're observing our emotions, we're observing our mm-hmm. sensations, we're observing the, the, you know, the things in our body and watching how, how our mind is responding to that. And, um, and this really starts to dive into cultivating the authentic self. Because the authentic self, it really is, it's that witness. It's, it's mm-hmm. that part of us that is really curious and really kind and compassionate and connected and creative. But it's really just like, cause our thoughts and, you know, even our emotions sometimes are not really who we are. We identify so strongly with them that it makes it, we kind of like incorporate it into our identity. Um, mm-hmm. And we over identify with the thoughts that are coming. We believe them. We can get attached to them. We create all these narratives and things and so the beauty of, you know, really participating in meditation and, and focusing on those things is really cultivating the authentic self and learning how to be more curious and more of that kind of state of witnessing, which means you're much more objective and more um, grounded and not so reactive to things because you can kind of, in all circumstances in life, and take just take a step back and be like, oh, well, that's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of making judgments and internalizing things and that sort of thing. So there's Absolutely. another benefit and power to meditation as well. And it's, you know, the, the, where my brain is going with that is, you know, if you can do that within yourself, then you can do that with groups of people because mm-hmm. now you're not identifying uh, or labeling someone based on what they're thinking of how they're, exp- um, how they're expressing, communicating verbally, physically. And you're going, oh, that person I can see is having this kind of an emotion right now. And therefore the words that they're saying might not actually be reflective of how they're feeling but if I can get behind the words I might be able to help them or might be able to you know respond in a way that's more you know proportional um, or appropriate as opposed to just taking that as face value um, 100%. so yeah. the work starts within here doesn't it and then mm-hmm. and goes outwards yeah okay absolutely. well um your title and I want to get this right I wrote it down you are a narcissistic abuse specialist and recovery coach Mm -hmm. so with that hat on (laughs) i have some questions for you that i thought we could go through um and question number one is probably the you know just the most obvious question what is narcissism what is a narcissist yes and that's a great question to start with because i think there's a lot of oops i'm on my notifications off there's a there's a lot of confusion around that you know that's a term that can be loosely thrown around we think of narcissists we think of someone that's you know love loving their reflection and um you know are self-centered and that sort of thing that's not really what a narcissist is you know when i say the word term narcissist i'm referring to someone that has narcissistic personality disorder which is a diagnosable disorder um there's nine criteria in the in the diagnostic manual the dsm-5 diagnostic manual that kind of characterizes a narcissist and without going through every single one I'll highlight some of the most important ones that um, really help us to identify and define this disorder which is number one grandiosity so narcissistic individuals with this disorder have a tendency to see themselves as superior to others they see themselves and sometimes that superiority isn't necessarily obvious Um, Because we have overt and we have covert narcissism. And there's a a few branches of that as well. But generally speaking, we we have a tendency to think of 
a narcissist, a grandiose narcissist as being like really self-inflated and, and obvious. Whereas a covert narcissist might feel superior more secretively, or they might feel superior even in their own victim mentality. So like I'm a bigger, bigger victim than you, and they feel superior in their victimhood. Um, they're the martyrs, right? Um, and so there, that is a pretty big key marker of, of the disorder, which also um, kind of lends to a sense of entitlement as well, which is another uh, symptom of the disorder. They feel entitled basically to you, to your resources, to your time, your energy, your body. Sometimes they have very blurred boundaries when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, they also see their children as an extension of themselves. They feel entitled to, you know, <clears throat> your emotions, your thoughts, like, you know, pretty much anything. Um, they also have a tendency to be very exploitative in their relationships. So their relationships tend to, tend to have a tendency to be very transactional, um, that they're kind of looking to get something from others. And they have a tendency to be like the takers in the relationship, mm -hmm. um, which is why they kind of pair really nicely with people who are codependent because they have a tendency to be the givers in their relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's see, what else am I missing here? Those are those are some really big ones to look out for. Um, and yeah. those are also things that really have a tendency to um, kind of make them a little bit separate. Because a lot of times we think of to, maybe we'll be following like a narcissistic abuse recovery page or something like that. And they'll be talking about things like gaslighting or mm -hmm. um, giving the silent treatment or some of the things that narcissistic individuals do. But those are not actually symptoms of the disorder. Yes, those are things that narcissists have a tendency to engage in because of because of their disorder. Mm -hmm. But those aren't necessarily strictly things that narcissists do. Like people with borderline personality disorder might engage in some of those behaviors. Even people with just simply insecure attachment or someone with ADHD or, you know, something like that. Like those people might also engage in some of those behaviors. And so I always tell people like when you're, trying to understand what a narcissist is, like look through those DSM-5 criteria, those nine criteria of which you need to have five. Mm. Um, oh, and the one I, other one I wanted to touch on was the empathy, right? So mm. you think mm -hmm. of a narcissist as having no empathy. Well, it's not necessarily true that they have no empathy. I think that's a, um, it, it's a misunderstanding of the disorder. They have impaired empathy. Um, and that's really important to make that distinction because um, there are moments where they will appear to have a great degree of empathy, um, but it is in their interpersonal relationships where they that will start to break down. So basically, the closer the attachment they have to a person, the lesser degree of empathy that they have. And I personally believe in all of my research of the disorder that this occurs because attachment triggers their avoidance and their apathy mm -hmm. um, because they feel uh, it's basically a very shame-based disorder. Where sure. the the grandiosity of their disorder has created this like shell around their shame. It's like this protective, innate protective mechanism. Mm. Um, and the closer the attachment that they have, the more that triggers their vulnerability and their inadequacy. And right. so then they start to have these trauma responses of apathy and a lack of empathy in in demonstrating empathy in these relationships. And they have cognitive empathy, meaning like they understand other people's, you know, they understand what the proper empathetic response is, and they can mimic that really well in the right circumstances. And, you know, because some people are like, well, I have empathy for everyone else. I just don't understand why they have it. They don't have it for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, I think you on that as well, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and it's just because of that close attachment, they, they, mm -hmm. it's like they, they have a tendency to shut their emotions down when it comes to those closer attachments, because it's safer for them to do that. Um, so, you know, this is, that's, that's the, how I, you know, like to look at the disorder in terms of like those key markers to look for. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And instead of using that term loosely narcissism, right. Yeah. And everyone's a narcissist because they gave me the silent treatment or they ghosted me or, you know, they mm -hmm. did something and they, they love bombed me, right. Love bombing is not necessarily a characteristic of a narcissist either people with ADHD also do a lot of mirroring and love bombing and that sort of thing and it, honestly and, and I'm probably going to get some flack for this but I honestly don't think that most narcissistic individuals are doing any of these things intentionally mm. 
I think that these are trauma responses that are programmed behaviors from very early childhood. Sure. And, you know, although that doesn't mean that they're not aware of the things that they're doing, they have enough awareness. They're not, they're not dumb. <laughs> they're actually usually very, you know, intelligent individuals that are very aware of the things that they're doing, but they just don't understand why they're doing them. And a lot yeah. of it is just an automatic response. And we could get into the subtle differences between like narcissism and ASPD, antisocial personality disorder, which is kind of a step above narcissism. So if you're dealing with someone that has no empathy, like zero empathy and someone who's engaging in really risky behaviors and is probably really violent or, um, you know, very calculating and that sort of thing, you may be dealing with either a malignant narcissist or a sociopath or a psychopath. Sure. Um, which I think malignant narcissism is honestly just a form of sociopathy. Um, but that's like a whole nother monster. That's even, mm -hmm. even worse. If we're, we're just talking about your regular run of the mill narcissist, I, there's really, I, I don't see them as these evil people that are just out to get yeah, everyone. Yeah. Um, I think they're very damaged people that are operating from their trauma responses. Not an excuse ever to treat someone no. poorly. Um, but no. it is, it is, you know, and one of the things that I like to highlight to people too is because it's triggering sometimes to tell people, oh, these people aren't doing this on purpose. They're not yes. like targeting you and trying to destroy you. Sometimes they will mm -hmm. do that. Sometimes they'll go into revenge and really try to sure. bring someone down. And without, but, without, you know, um, you know, dismissing, you know, people's experiences, you know, if, if someone is operating out of trauma, out of pain, you know, I, I think I'm on the same page as you. I don't think that there's going to be an intentional need or desire to want to hurt someone. Um, it's, you know, if it's a shame-based trauma, then as soon as someone gets close to you and we're talking about attachment, um, all of a sudden they can see the shame that I carry around, um, putting myself in their shoes. Oh, no, they can see my shame and therefore I, the wall's going to go up and mm -hmm. I'm now operating out of a, a, a flight, fright, I can never say it. Fight, fight. <laughs> fight, fight, <freeze. laughs> I know that's a tongue twister. <laughs> is, um, from that response mode, and that, yeah. and then therefore the emotions that I'm having are not being, you know, processed well, and and I'm going back to my early childhood or you know whatever traumatic state happened earlier on because I haven't processed it. Um, yeah. Exactly. yeah. No, I think I'm on the same page with you from that perspective. And again, it doesn't make any of the behavior okay, but it just helps to kind of see them as a human and not so much as this, you know, um, evil, you know, being that wants to cause you harm. Yeah. And I like looking at that way too, because I feel like it's less personal. Mm. And I think people like to internalize and personalize the abuse and they're yeah. not doing themselves any favor by doing that. Um, because when you can kind of put a little bit of separation and go, well, wait a second, this person is not doing this to me because of me. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. doing this to me because of them, because of something's wrong with them, because there's some really, really broken things within them that, that they need to deal with. Not my responsibility. I, I didn't do anything to cause that. It's sure. just coming from them. And, yeah. you know, I think it's a little confusing for people because there are times where narcissists will take pleasure in someone else's pain they'll right. smirk or they'll laugh at them or they sure. will you know humiliate them in certain ways and i always kind of draw this comparison to a child you know um if you have children and you've noticed like i have two boys they're 10 and 5 and my older son sometimes will cause harm to my younger son and then he'll smirk about it mm -hmm. And I realized as a parent and looking into attachment and that sort of thing that that's, he doesn't, he's not smirking because he, he is, is reveling in his brother's pain. He's smirking because he feels uncomfortable with himself and doesn't know how to respond in that moment. And so it's a defense mechanism for him to go into that response. And the worst thing that I could do as a parent is shame, shame him for that response. Sure. And be like, you don't care about your brother because that's not true. You know, mm. I just, I want to understand that instead. And so um, with a narcissist, I think that's oftentimes like they get this, sometimes they get this weird sense of justice too. Like when you're in pain, because oftentimes they're trying to cause you pain because they perceive that you harms them. And it's just like this retaliatory thing that they do. Yeah. Um, and so and this is a lot of times to the mental gymnastics that they do to justify their own behavior. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a tit for tat. It's very childish. And that's because of their arrested development. Then they didn't emotionally develop past a certain mm -hmm. age. And this is things that children do. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, you hit me, so I'm going to hit you back. And, you know, yeah. even if even the other person didn't even do it on purpose, you know, because kids are be flailing around and oops, they hit someone else. And then the other kids like, you know, and so that's kind of that narcissist mentality mm -hmm. is that you hurt me. So I'm going to make sure that you hurt and I'm yeah. going to feel good about it because I feel justified now. I was going to um, say there's a sense of justice, you know, mm -hmm. on a unhealthy justice but justice nonetheless um that's happening right. on the inside right. right okay yep and that that's a pretty those are that's a pretty defining characteristic of the disorder as well as that sense of like you know i'm right and you're wrong and you know i am entitled to do this to you because you did this to me mm. kind of thing yeah okay thank you for that um my next question, and I think we've kind of covered some of that, is 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 everyone a narcissist? Do we all have narcissistic traits? Um, mm. But I think you kind of well, actually, let me let me leave it there and see yes. your response first. Yeah, and and I'm glad you asked that because I kind of hate that term, that narcissistic traits or narcissistic tendencies, because of how it creates this gray area between like what an actual narcissist is. Right. Um, and so I prefer to say everyone has a degree of trauma responses. Um, mm -hmm. And when we, when we label it that way, it, it starts to point more towards the root cause, right? And even medicalizing something like narcissistic personality disorder, like labels can be helpful and they can equally be hurtful. Sure. Because it, it, now we've just kind of like given it a label, it's said and done, that's what it is, instead of getting curious about, okay, well, if this is a specific set of trauma responses that we're turning into a diagnosis, well, then, you know, can we change that? It, it, can mm -hmm. we heal that? Is there something we can do about that? And so I like using the return trauma responses because then it helps us get curious, like, well, if this is a trauma response, where did it come from? You know, and what can we do about that? And, and there's a lot of times too, when people get out of relationships with a narcissist, you know, they oftentimes feel like they are the narcissist because it's either been projected onto them mm. or they see some of those, you know, narcissistic abuse pages and they're talking about gaslighting and, you know, uh, and sometimes think people think going no contact is, is ghosting or giving the silent treatment. And there's just some convolution around that or they feel like they've discarded the narcissist, so maybe they're the narcissist, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. But and if we are, get a little bit more curious about the root cause of these things, then it helps us to unpack like, okay, well, no, I'm, I'm not a narcissist. I'm just wounded. Um, and I have, you know, some unhealthy responses. And also, I also want to mention too, that if we have this term of like everyone, I guess everyone just has narcissistic traits. I hear people say that all the time. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, why are we normalizing that? Why are we mm -hmm. normalizing the fact that people are acting in these kind of selfish and hurtful ways towards other people rather than yeah. getting curious that this is not human nature. And that's the thing that really pisses mm -hmm. me off sometimes is that we just chalk it up to human nature yes. that people are just selfish and unkind to each other. And I think that that is so far from the truth because I know that our authentic selves, you know, going back to love, right. Going mm -hmm. back to, you know, what we truly are at our core, which is mm -hmm. curious and compassionate and kind and creative and connected. And, you know, that state of love, um, you know, narcissistic traits are not just a human mm -hmm. condition. We're not just like inherently broken. Um, and so, you know, calling them trauma responses, we can go back to, okay, well, where's this coming from and how can we reverse it? Sure. No, that's really helpful. And I think to add to that, I think, um, just, just having these, like you said, medical labels to help navigate through conditions and, and, and work things out is really helpful. But then when they become part of like, you know, your everyday lingo, it actually reduces and diminishes, you know, what the actual thing is. And I'll, I'll use anxiety as an example. So when I hear someone say, oh, I dropped my burger just as, you know, as I got out of the fast food place and I dropped my burger, gave me, I had so much anxiety and I'm like, you didn't you didn't you didn't have anxiety that wasn't anxiety you felt frustrated maybe and mm -hmm. um and maybe there was some 
you know, maybe there was some fear because you didn't have any money to buy some more or something like that. And you were worried about your next meal or something. Fair enough. But anxiety, you know, is a very different thing. And and because that's my background, I kind of, I don't, you know, it doesn't offend me or anything like that. But I start to think, oh, you know, we, we live in a world that's so polarized that mm -hmm. even a, a thing hey, I didn't want to speak to this person today because it's better for my mental health if I don't speak to this person. And But now all of a sudden, like you said, you know, you've ghosted the person, you've given them the silent treatment, and now all of a sudden, oh, this person's a narcissist, you know, uh, more so like an overt narcissist because they just think they're more superior. And and it just goes, it's just, it just like such a slippery slope. Whereas, yeah. you know, I'm really thankful that you're able to sort of clear that up a little bit and, and then speak a little bit about what, what, you know, what the definition is as well. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. It does it does dilute things a lot and creates a lot of confusion. And so that's why I'm like, don't be using that term unless we're describing something very specific here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm guilty of it. You know, I've used the term. Um, I've used lots of different. I mean, I'm. I've, hey, I've made loads of mistakes. <laughs> but um, you know, you just. But I think as you grow, you start to think you know really deeply it really you know uh, intentionally about hang on what kind of vocabulary am i using and what am i putting out into the world and am i just regurgitating the things that i have been experienced or um, been exposed to um and then just not really thinking through you know i'm a cog in the chain or am i actually going to stop that cog and say no actually you know it's a bit like the word manifesting when we talked about it earlier on you know it's like, okay, but what does that actually mean? You know, um, and, and I think it helps us. I think vocabulary is really important. And I think, you know, um, social media doesn't help when it associates, you know, when people are associating things that don't actually mean what they, in the real definition of that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with that. One of my questions was, does a narcissist have a lack of empathy? But I think you touched on that as well. So that was really helpful. Um, and what I got out of that as well is, you know, if, if it is a shame-based disorder and there is empathy from, from, from arm's length for people, it makes sense when there isn't empathy for people who are getting closer into that circle or closer to the wall that's been built up. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that or is, does that pretty much cover? No, I think that pretty much covers it. Um, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, does a gender play a part? Is a female narcissist typically different from a male one or is it irrelevant? Um, I think it is relevant because um, although, you know, looking through those DSM-5 criteria, you know, like they're all going to display the same general traits, but mm -hmm. how those traits are expressed is going to be different. And, you know, narcissistic individuals are going to play on their strengths and they're going to play on, you know, their, the societal roles, they're going to play on their family roles, they're going to play on the things that work for them. So with women, women have a tendency to use like their sexuality or use um, their looks or that sort of thing as a primary way to get you know, what we call narcissistic supply, which narcissistic supply is validation, it's attention, it's admiration, it is, you know, kind of garnering that sense of control and superiority through their interactions with others. And that's not always, you know, we think of narcissistic supply often as positive interactions. That That's not what that means, though. They equally get uh, that narcissistic supply from negative reactions as well. So, you know, if you're angry or revengeful or upset with them, they get a lot of power out of that, out of being able to provoke those kinds of reactions out of you, especially uh -huh. once you've gotten into a closer relationship with them because they've already gotten past the love bombing. They've already gotten past that kind of like, you know, phase of them actually putting you on a pedestal. And now you've kind of fallen from grace and they take a bit of pleasure in um, controlling your emotions in that way. Um uh -huh. So that being said, you know, a female narcissist is going to maybe in a, a relationship with a male, um, utilize some of those gender roles, you know, mm -hmm. and, and play on that. So, you know, um, and it, this can equally be so in the, the, the opposite direction as well, depending on the relationship dynamic and the, the sure. individuals in the relationship. So it's definitely nuanced. But generally speaking, you know, a woman may shame a man for not being a provider or not providing well enough and, and as a way to like control um and and kind of trigger his sense of you know i think because mm -hmm. men innately have 
um, kind of like a hero complex. Like they want to, yeah. you know, protect and provide. I think that that's just innate in most men. Mm. And so a narcissistic woman will capitalize on that and try to kind of weaponize those things against a man. Mm -hmm. um, and also when it comes to having children, you know, narcissistic women are definitely, you know, have a tendency to live vicariously through their children. Narcissistic men will do the same. But what I've seen with narcissistic women is that lasts well through adulthood. So um, narcissistic mothers will have a tendency to wield guilt tripping as a form of control over her adult children and that sort of thing. Male narcissists mm -hmm. will too, but female narcissists just have a knack for it. My grandma, mm -hmm. my grandma was an expert at it, um, just kind of like taking those subtle digs and, you know, and they also have a tendency to be more on the covert side of narcissism. Right. Um, and I think that has more to do with like, um, you know, women don't have that physical strength and, you know, aggression that men can have. So women have a tendency to have to be more, um, you know, maybe subtly manipulative and that sort of thing okay. to get what they want because they can't use physical intimidation as much as men could potentially use for physical intimidation. So I think that there is kind of those things that, that you have to take into account. There are grandiose female narcissists for sure. Um, but, you know, so it's not like it's cut and dry across the board. And of course, we've got, you know, different kind of gender norms and that sort of thing, you know, um, gay relationships and that sort of thing where that might kind of come out differently. Um, but generally speaking, that's kind of what you would see in a female narcissist versus a male narcissist. Right. Thank you. That's really helpful, actually. Yeah, really helpful. Um, how can you tell if you're in a toxic relationship? Um, I know it's a big question and it can go in all sorts of directions, but you know, around this theme here. So if you're in a relationship with a narcissist or I was going to ask you if you're a narcissist who's in a relationship, I guess I'm always, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at both sides, but yeah, how, how can you tell if your relationship is toxic? Would you say? Well, so number one, can you set boundaries? Um, and this is a little tricky because some people don't know what a boundary really is. Mm -hmm. Um, they think that just expressing their needs and feelings is setting a boundary. Um, that's not really setting a boundary. That's expressing a need and expressing how you feel, how, what the other person does with that is kind of up to them. Boundaries mm -hmm. require consequent con consequences. Like if I do this, then, and you continue to do this, then this is what's going to happen sort of thing. Right. Um, but Generally speaking, if you're in a toxic relationship and you try to express a need or a feeling and, and even, even implement some of those consequences, the other person's reaction will say a lot. Mm. So, you know, in a healthy relationship dynamic, if you express um, a boundary or even a, a need or a feeling in that case, um, the other person would listen and you know, they may not necessarily agree with everything that you're saying, but they don't have to respond in a disrespectful manner, right? right. They'll listen, they're absorbed. They'll be like, okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, and, you know, and, and here's what I'm going to do, or here's what, how I'm going to respond to that. In a toxic relationship, generally speaking, the other person um, will oftentimes, maybe not all the time, but oftentimes respond in a defensive way or a deflective way. Or like try to punish you if it's something that, that they don't really like or respect. Um, or try to diminish how you're feeling in some way. And the reason why that happens is because they're internalizing your feelings. They're taking it personally that you're bringing something to them and it's causing them to feel inadequate. So they're rejecting it. Right. right. So and this can happen in a non-narcissistic relationship, this yes, can happen if you're, you know, just yeah. having secure attachment and you're just like internalizing those things and going, oh my God, they're blaming me for how mm -hmm. they feel. Right. And it, and it depends on delivery. Sometimes, sometimes people will directly be like, you made me feel this way. Right. Um, and that's not really fair either. And if someone is doing that to you, that is also another sign of, of a toxic relationship. If someone mm -hmm. is constantly blaming you for, the tone of the relationship or how, how they feel or things going wrong, right? Or if you try to bring up an issue that you are noticing in the relationship, they sidestep and blame you, right? right. Oh, well, it, that wouldn't be a problem if you hadn't done this, right? So there's a lot of, you know, uh, flipping that happens in toxic relationships where you never really feel like you can get anything resolved because every mm -hmm. time you bring up an issue, that person either flips it around on you or they bring in things from the past to beat you yep. over the head with as a yeah. way to deflect from the current issue at hand. 
And by the way, gaslighting isn't simply just lying. Okay, like anyone can lie in a relationship, but gaslighting is when someone lies so vehemently that it actually confuses your reality. Like, and a lot of times there's some devaluing that occurs in there as well, where they're like, no, I didn't say that. You're crazy. You know, mm. you, no, that didn't happen. You obviously can't remember things very well. So it's like where they're taking your reality and they're twisting it and then making you feel like you're, you know, there's something wrong with you for even bringing that up or saying that or doing that. Right. And so again, another, another sign of a toxic relationship is when someone devalues you in that way, because, you know, respectful communication, you don't have to insult someone to get your point mm. across. Right. Mm. Mm. And also, uh, the, the, the feeling of walking on eggshells or, or, and, or confusion in the relationship. So right. if you are feeling like you constantly have to, um, predict the other person's mood all the time, and then like, try to decipher like, Ooh, is it okay for me to say this right now? Because if I yeah. say this, am I going to set them off? Or, you know, I can already tell that they're in one of those moods. So I better go hide in the other room until like they, um, are better or whatever. Um, that's a pretty big sign that you're in a toxic relationship because mm -hmm. you should never have to tiptoe around your partner's moods. Yeah. Um, and I would add, I would just like to sort of, yeah. As a bit of a disclaimer to say, you know, if that happens once or twice, you know, it's fine, like it's life, right? But if this is something that's happening over yes. and over and it becomes yes. a like almost everyday kind of occurrence, then, you know, that's when, you know, the red flags are there. Um, so I just want to throw that out there to anyone listening, you know, if they, yeah. if they had one occurrence of that, you know, don't, don't throw the relationship away. But, you know, if, if it's it's if it's um, something that's ongoing and, and it, again, it really like I think it, for me, when you talked about it being a shame based disorder, when you're saying even these things you think you know being super defensive about something that's that's elevating that shame within them isn't it it's it's growing it yeah yeah absolutely and and I love that you said that because it's it's very true you know I, I there's times in my current relationship where my husband has gotten really moody and and my trauma response oftentimes is like oh my god what did I do you mm. know like and I think that we often have that as we have a tendency to internalize our, our partner's emotional state. You know, that's for us to work on. But like, that's not a deal breaker in our relationship because it, people get moody, you know, like people have these moods. And sometimes it's our responses that kind of perpetuate it too. So we have to look at ourselves and go, okay, well, is this a pattern of behavior? And what happens when I address it? So that's a mm -hmm. really big, you know, key thing here too, is that do you feel like you can address when those things cause you discomfort and you know can i so one of the things that i've learned too in my relationship is is in order to have a healthy relationship you have to take ownership even when things make you uncomfortable and you feel like it's the other person's fault right yes so for example you know my husband having a moody day where he's kind of shut down and silent i'm internalizing it and later on i come up to him and i say hey you made me feel really uncomfortable when you know you were giving me the silent treatment and acting really moody that's not the right way to approach that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. We want to approach that conversation with, hey, you know, I noticed that something's going on. Um, I, and I know it has nothing to do with me, but it did cause me to feel pretty uncomfortable and I'd love to address it with you. So like something like that where I'm taking ownership and recognizing that the discomfort that I'm feeling is, is coming from within me. It has nothing to do with how he's feeling. Um, sure. And I'm trying not to take it personally, but I can't help it sometimes. And so I can, I can, I, I can call that out and say, hey, I'm taking this personally even though yep. it probably doesn't have anything to do with me. And even if it does, maybe that's something we just need to work on, you know, yeah, something sure. like that. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, we're going to, we are going to, we are going to end on a good note in terms of recovery. Cause I know that's a big part of what you do as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you what a trauma bond was. Um, mm. There's been a lot of talk out there about, you know, being trauma bonded to someone in a relationship and this is a relationship series. So that's what kind of, yeah, came to mind when I was thinking of questions. What is a trauma bond? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, well, so tra trauma bonding is, a, is an unhealthy attachment to ha that you have to someone that you know is causing you harm. And to go a little deeper on that, it is an addiction. So, you know, I think that that um, term sometimes is misused as well. Like, like, oh, I'm trauma bonded just because like, you know, you're having an issue like leaving a relationship. Sometimes that is the case, but trauma bonding is serious. It is something that um, causes people to do and say things that they wouldn't normally do. 
And it Mm -hmm. also can be a very deep biochemical addiction as well. So people who Mm -hmm. are experiencing trauma bonding in attempting to relieve a relationship, a lot of times will experience even physical symptoms in leaving that relationship. They'll experience pretty heavy rumination where they are questioning themselves constantly. They feel almost a physical sense of pain when they try to let go of the attachment to that person. Um, And trauma bonding can only occur if there is previous attachment trauma from childhood. It it stems from an inconsistent emotional bond to a parent as a child that is then manifesting in that relationship. And a trauma bond is formed because of the inconsistent emotional attention that you get from that partner. So love bombing, devaluation, love bombing, devaluation, like going back and forth through those cycles actually creates a biochemical addiction where um, during the love bombing phase, maybe you're experiencing a lot of like oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine and that sort of thing. And then when the devaluing occurs, then your body is flooded with cortisol and all kinds of stress hormones and that sort of thing. And then your body gets addicted to the cycle and just like a drug. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, in that relationship, when you're in that devaluing phase and you feel so low and so mm-hmm. just like, you know, kind of in between hits of that drug. Right. When that person gives you even just a little bit of attention or a little bit of love bombing or, or even just some breadcrumbs and you get that little hit of oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, that sort of thing. It provides so much relief to the suffering that you're experiencing before that you get addicted to the relief. So you're constantly coming back and then you get addicted to that person specifically because they feel like they are a a soothing balm to your wounds, even though they're creating it. And so when someone's coming out of a relationship and they're trauma bonded to that person, it defies all logic because they know logically that that person has abused them, has done all these horrible things to them, but their brain is playing all kinds of tricks on them. They have things like euphoric recall where they're only focusing on the positive parts of the relationship. They, they can't right. seem to remember the, the abuse because their brain has compartmentalized it for them. Right. Or they have a lot of cognitive dissonance where, you know, there's this conflict between the two versions of that person that they, they know, like, which is the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Right. So mm-hmm. like, on the one hand, they are this loving, you know, amazing person that they fell in love with. And then on the other hand, there's the abuser. And so yeah. their system is kind of holding on to that vision of that loving person because it's too painful for them to face mm-hmm. the, the reality of the abuser. Um, and so that's a big part of trauma bonding as well. And it's it can be a very, very difficult addiction to break and very dangerous for people because they keep end, ending up going back to a relationship where, yeah. you know, in some cases, right, they might actually leave the relationship because they get killed or suicide or, you know, something like that. So um, it's it's definitely, it's something that I deal with a lot with my clients and trying to help break that addiction. And it's like one of those mm-hmm. addictions too. And I, I use this analogy all the time, you know, <clears throat> not to, not to disparage any people who are alcoholics or suffering from alcoholism, but you know, what, what addiction, like with alcoholism, right? Like you can stop going to the liquor store. You can stop going to the bar. You know, you can abstain from that and learn how to manage that and, and shift your lifestyle. But what addiction is that, that, you know, that addictive thing going to actually chase you down and mm. constantly, because narcissistic individuals, a good portion of the time, don't ever want to let you go. They mm. want to hold on to you. And so even as, as many times as you try to block them or get away from them or stop engaging with them, they're like chasing you down at the same time and hounding you or, yeah. you know, occasionally checking in with you. And just when you think you're getting better, they pop up again. And so that's why that's one of the reasons, too, why it's such a challenging uh, addiction to break mm. as well. Makes so much sense. And if there is a cycle of trauma bond, you go, oh, I've been separate or, I, you know, we've had some space from each other for a while. And then you go, oh, yeah, you know, we had some good times. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're back and then you go, oh, OK, yeah, that's why I kind of went in that direction in the first place. Yeah. Um, um, I'm just mindful of time. So I just want to ask you a couple of last questions. Um, if you could, if you could, if someone was in a relationship with a narcissist and an actual narcissist in the def- you know the, the ways that you've defined today um what would be the way for them to break free from that and what i mean by that is you know there's stuff out there that talks about closure talks about having a final conversation talks about trying to explain your way just to get some closure or you know another schools of thoughts is like look it's done it's dusted the closure the all the closure you need is to walk away you know what based on your work with 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 you know this field what would you say is a 
is there is there a you know an appropriate way or is it nuanced well it's pretty cut and dry with narcissists um simply because the normal standard for leaving a relationship does not apply um Mm. most of the time you know we would want to seek closure and have some sort of resolution there but the moment that you try to seek that from a narcissist, they see that as an opportunity to keep you hooked in the relationship. So they're going to do everything that they can to create more confusion, to create more doubt, to create more defensiveness, to keep you engaging with them. So having that final conversation and trying to create closure with them will only open you up to more suffering and more confusion. Um, because one of the powers that a narcissist has is in something called induced conversation. So one of the ways that they control people is getting you to engage with them. And right. they'll do that by triggering all of your wounds, by poking at all of your shame, by getting you to defend yourself, by calling you names or telling you you're a bad person or even triggering you by, you know, through their own suffering. Oh, you're causing me so much pain. I can't believe you're doing this to me. All of those things. And so you know, this is why no contact is like one of those touted, you know, ways to break free from those types of relationships, which isn't always realistic because not everyone is in a position to go no contact, you know, if they're co-parenting and that sort of thing. But what is no contact? It's a boundary. It's a form. It's like a really powerful form of disengagement. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that really is the only thing. And this actually has so much to do with you and your level of acceptance and being able to let go yourself as well knowing like I did everything that I could I I I tried my best Mm -hmm. and I've tried everything and that's usually you know where people are with these types of relationships they've given everything over to this person they've tried every trick in the book they've tried to understand they tried to be empathetic they've tried all of these things Mm -hmm. trying one more time isn't going to help. Um, and so you have to get to that point of, okay, I've tried everything. I'm done. I can't continue to to lose myself to this person because they're just not getting it. Mm, if there's anything left by that point, you know, from yeah. that person as well. I can really see that codependent, overly empathetic nature as well, you know, trying to solve that, trying to bring some resolve or trying to at least, you know, have a have some kind of resolution there. So yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, last question. Um, what are the green flags to look for in a relationship? And I know there are loads of green flags. So, you know, aside from, you know, feeling good around the person and having maybe some shared values and some shared interests and things like that, what kind of things would you say are day to day things that you'd be like, Oh, this is a, this is a green flag. Look, look for these things. Hmm. Um, and I'll just share a little bit of what I noticed with my husband that really helped our relationship, which is number one, how he approached conversations. If there was something that he knew was uncomfortable or something that might be triggering, he always prefaced the conversation like, Hey, you know, um, this may be uncomfortable, but I'd really like to talk to you about it. Right. So like mentally preparing me to have a difficult conversation. That was something I was like, wow, I've never experienced that before. That was, I appreciated that so much because it helped me to like mentally frame myself and get ready for a difficult conversation. They usually weren't ever as bad as he was making it out to be either. Um, and so, you know, respectful communication, does that person, you know, really take you into consideration and, you know, sometimes people just have a tendency, well, when I get mad, I, I, I say things I don't mean. You know, there's like a, a level of an integrity in a person that never uses any name calling, never says things that they don't mean, like is really impeccable with their word. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that is something that I really look for in, in all of my relationships, friendships, and otherwise is like how, how, in, how, how much integrity does that person have and looking at all areas of their life, right? If someone yeah. is lacking integrity in like a specific area of life, if they're like in business or in, you know, in these types of relationships or, you know, that sort of thing, that's likely to translate into other areas. So it's really Mm -hmm. important that you see that that person is, you know, their words are, their actions are following their words. And there's, you know, that there isn't a lot of misalignment there. It doesn't mean with everything, you know, like sometimes there's little things and people are going to have, you know, they're going to make mistakes, right? But what is like the overall general tone? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, just looking at how they, you know, treat others as well. Like, you know, just observing, how they treat others and, you know, whether it's their children or their parents or their, you know, brothers and sisters or, you know, people on the street, 
right? That's usually a pretty good marker. Um, right. And also, one of the things I always tell people to look out for too is is how much how patient and how willing are they to wait and respect your boundaries mm-hmm. in a relationship. Because right. I think we have a culture nowadays that has a tendency to just rush relationships where mm-hmm. like, you know, three months down the road, we're already like about to move in with each other. And, you know, it's so incredibly important to slow down in mm-hmm. relationships and take your time. And if yeah. someone is not willing to respect your timeline for the relationship, oof, look out. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if you're wanting to slow things down, if you're wanting to really take your time and they're and they're uncomfortable with that, then that does not bode well. Because what are they trying to rush? What are they trying to like gloss over mm-hmm. by rushing into a relationship with you? Mm-hmm. And um, really, I think it really comes down to you. You know, knowing the green flags, knowing the red flags and all of those things are are important. But one of the things that I discovered with myself is that if I was in integrity with myself, if I didn't know myself really well and know what my boundaries were and know what my likes and dislikes were or know like what my non-negotiables were and Mm -hmm. how to actually implement and enforce those, then you can know all the red or green flags that you want. Mm -hmm. You'll miss them if you're not in integrity with yourself, if you don't have that relationship with yourself. Because it's, because you know, just going back to like the neuroscience of like the subconscious mind is like 90% of our cognition. So if we have unconscious programs that are running, that's what's actually causing our attraction. That's what's causing us to make certain choices that are getting us in toxic relationships. And so a big Mm. part of my work is really just addressing those things, addressing the subconscious beliefs, addressing those subconscious patternings. If you change that, then you don't have to be so hyper vigilant of like noticing like, well, what does this mean? And what does that mean? You feel it and you know, and you go, when things come up, which they will, you're like, oh, I'm okay with this. No, I'm not okay with this. And then mm-hmm. you can easily go, well, this person is just isn't for me. I don't need to keep trying here if it's not working. Absolutely. And something, something you touched on there that I think is a, is a, is a nice way to to kind of come to a close is 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 self love, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you have integrity within yourself, if you if you can see boundaries within yourself and the way that you treat yourself, um, that's going to then. I think we touched on it earlier on in the conversation as well. That's going to sort of outpour into the relationships that you have um, with mm-hmm. other people. And on that note, your Instagram handle is. Uh, you can find me um, at on Instagram, basically at the self love method. Um, you can also find me at uh, the self method dot coach, which is my main website. Um, that'll basically just take you to my course. I don't have a full robust website yet. I just haven't felt the necess- necessity for it. Um, I'm going to be stepping back from one on one coaching this next year since I'm going to be um, a mother again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I'm, I'm going to be selling my courses, which I'm really excited about. I'm coming out with a trauma bonding course as well. Um, that will be released at the beginning of next year, which. I'm super excited about and then my boot camp which is basically the self-love method it's like all of you know my tools and tips and somatic work and um, lots of different types of healing tools and that sort of thing to help you recover from from toxic relationships and that sort of thing phenomenal thank you so much i'll put links in the description below as well to make it easier for people to find you um i'd love to continue uh, talking to you in the future so it'd be lovely to have you back again thank you so much again um uh people can find you at those places and uh you know from from my perspective you know here at going courage we are talking about building courage and i know that this topic here is something that if you are um experiencing you know these kinds of things in your relationship uh or you know starting to date and you know trying to pluck up some courage to to look for green flags and not to stay in your sort of fearful state of just accepting whatever comes i think you know this is really helpful information so thank you so much tiara it's been a pleasure speaking to you today thank you rex i really appreciate you having me fantastic all right so if you're listening from home um i just want to say whatever you're doing keep moving forward and keep going in courage i'll see you on the next one hey really hope that was a conversation that you found interesting and that you were able to gain something from tiara's insights um Uh, I said it in the conversation, I think there were some really uh, deep topics, some real uh, meat on the bone in that conversation. But at the same time, I feel like, you know, we only really scratched the surface. So if you do want to connect with her, she is open for connection. So do get in touch via the links. I'll put some um, links in the description as well. 
All right. So this episode was part of a relationship series. We have more coming up. So stay tuned. Um, and yep, whatever you're doing in life, I know I say it every time and I really mean it sincerely as well. I want to encourage you to keep moving forward in courage. If you're someone who has experienced some of the things that we've talked about today, or maybe you have found yourself in a place where you were the one who, you know, caused some harm you know my encouragement to you is to have some time of self-reflection see what you need and go seek some professional help where you can and and be you know get get yourself plugged into a supportive community um, and allow yourself to heal feel and move forward 